I met men at every turn who owned from 1,000 to 30,000 feet in undeveloped silver mines, every single foot of which they believed would shortly be worth from $50 to $1,000, and as often as any other way they were men who had not $25 in the world. Every man you met had his new mind to boast of, and his specimens ready, and if the opportunity offered, he would infallibly back you into a corner and offer as a favor to you, not to him, to part with just a few feet in the Golden Age, or the Sarah Jane, or some other unknown stack of croppings, for money enough to get a square meal with, as the phrase went. And you were never to reveal that he had made you the offer at such a ruinous price, for it was only out of friendship for you that he was willing to make the sacrifice. Then he would fish a piece of rock out of his pocket, and after looking mysteriously around as if he feared he might be waylaid and robbed if caught with such wealth in his possession, he would dab the rock against his tongue, clap an eyeglass to it, and exclaim, Look at that! Right there in that red dirt! See it? See the specks of gold? And the streak of silver? That's from the Uncle Abe. There's a hundred thousand tons like that in sight. Right in sight, mind you. And when we get down on it and the ledge comes in solid, it will be the richest thing in the world. Look at the assay. I don't want you to believe me, look at the assay. 216.jpg, 63k. Then he would get out a greasy sheet of paper which showed that the portion of rock assayed had given evidence of containing silver and gold in the proportion of so many hundreds or thousands of dollars to the ton. I little knew, then, that the custom was to hunt out the richest piece of rock and get it assayed. Very often, that piece, the size of a filbert, was the only fragment in a ton that had a particle of metal in it and yet the assay made it pretend to represent the average value of the ton of rubbish it came from. On such a system of assaying as that, the Humboldt world had gone crazy. On the authority of such assays its newspaper correspondents were frothing about rock worth four and seven thousand dollars a ton. And does the reader remember, a few pages back, the calculations, of a quoted correspondent, whereby the ore is to be mined and shipped all the way to England, the metals extracted, and the gold and silver contents received back by the miners as clear profit, the copper, antimony and other things in the ore being sufficient to pay all the expenses incurred? Everybody's head was full of such calculations as those, such raving insanity, rather. Few people took work into their calculations, or outlay of money either, except the work and expenditures of other people. We never touched our tunnel or our shaft again. Why? Because we judged that we had learned the real secret of success in silver mining, which was, not to mine the silver ourselves by the sweat of our brows and the labor of our hands, but to sell the ledges to the dull slaves of toil and let them do the mining. Before leaving Carson, the secretary and I had purchased feet from various Esmeralda stragglers. We had expected immediate returns of bullion, but were only afflicted with regular and constant assessments instead, demands for money wherewith to develop the said mines. These assessments had grown so oppressive that it seemed necessary to look into the matter personally. Therefore I projected a pilgrimage to Carson and thence to Esmeralda. I bought a horse and started, in company with Mr. Ballou and a gentleman named Ollendorf, a Prussian, not the party who has inflicted so much suffering on the world with his wretched foreign grammars, with their interminable repetitions of questions which never have occurred and are never likely to occur in any conversation among human beings. We rode through a snowstorm for two or three days, and arrived at Honey Lake Smith's, a sort of isolated inn on the Carson River. It was a two-story log house situated on a small knoll in the midst of the vast basin or desert through which the sickly Carson winds its melancholy way. Close to the house were the overland stage stables, built of sun-dried bricks. There was not another building within several leagues of the place. Toward sunset about twenty hay wagons arrived and camped around the house and all the teamsters came in to supper, a very, very rough set. There were one or two overland stage drivers there, also, and half a dozen vagabonds and stragglers, consequently the house was well crowded. We walked out, after supper, and visited a small Indian camp in the vicinity. 
The Indians were in a great hurry about something, and were packing up and getting away as fast as they could. In their broken English they said, by and by, heap water, and by the help of signs made us understand that in their opinion a flood was coming. The weather was perfectly clear, and this was not the rainy season. There was about a foot of water in the insignificant river, or maybe two feet, the stream was not wider than a back alley in a village, and its banks were scarcely higher than a man's head. So, where was the flood to come from? We canvassed the subject a while and then concluded it was a ruse, and that the Indians had some better reason for leaving in a hurry than fears of a flood in such an exceedingly dry time. 218.jpg, 37k At seven in the evening we went to bed in the second story, with our clothes on, as usual, and all three in the same bed, for every available space on the floors, chairs, etc., was in request, and even then there was barely room for the housing of the inn's guests. An hour later we were awakened by a great turmoil, and springing out of bed we picked our way nimbly among the ranks of snoring teamsters on the floor and got to the front windows of the long room. A glance revealed a strange spectacle, under the moonlight. The crooked Carson was full to the brim, and its waters were raging and foaming in the wildest way, sweeping around the sharp bends at a furious speed, and bearing on their surface a chaos of logs, brush and all sorts of rubbish. A depression, where its bed had once been, in other times, was already filling, and in one or two places the water was beginning to wash over the main bank. Men were flying hither and thither, bringing cattle and wagons close up to the house, for the spot of high ground on which it stood extended only some thirty feet in front and about a hundred in the rear. Close to the old river bed just spoken of, stood a little log stable, and in this our horses were lodged. 219.jpg, 173k While we looked, the waters increased so fast in this place that in a few minutes a torrent was roaring by the little stable and its margin encroaching steadily on the logs. We suddenly realized that this flood was not a mere holiday spectacle, but meant damage and not only to the small log stable but to the overland buildings close to the main river, for the waves had now come ashore and were creeping about the foundations and invading the great hay corral adjoining. We ran down and joined the crowd of excited men and frightened animals. We waded knee-deep into the log stable, unfastened the horses and waded out almost waist-deep, so fast the waters increased. Then the crowd rushed in a body to the hay corral and began to tumble down the huge stacks of baled hay and roll the bales up on the high ground by the house. Meantime it was discovered that Owens, an overland driver, was missing, and a man ran to the large stable, and wading in, boot-top deep, discovered him asleep in his bed, awoke him, and waded out again. But Owens was drowsy and resumed his nap, but only for a minute or two, for presently he turned in his bed, his hand dropped over the side and came in contact with the cold water. It was up level with the mattress. He waded out, breast deep, almost, and the next moment the sunburned bricks melted down like sugar and the big building crumbled to a ruin and was washed away in a twinkling. At eleven o'clock only the roof of the little log stable was out of water and our inn was on an island in mid-ocean. As far as the eye could reach, in the moonlight, there was no desert visible, but only a level waste of shining water. The Indians were true prophets, but how did they get their information? I am not able to answer the question. We remained cooped up eight days and nights with that curious crew. Swearing, drinking and card-playing were the order of the day, and occasionally a fight was thrown in for variety. Dirt and vermin, but let us forget those features, their profusion is simply inconceivable, it is better that they remain so. There were two men however, this chapter is long enough.